everyone who's joining online, thanks for joining. Uh, the goal here today is for about community, is about learning. Actually, good chat with Jonathan prior to this call about the challenges of skilled labor shortage and like mentorship in the industry and just folks kind of leaving the industry and new folks coming up and how can we all help each other, you know, collaborate with each other, share with each other and make the industry stronger. So this is one very small pebble step in that direction to get three amazing superintendents online on the line and just talk shop for an hour. Um, so we're really excited about this. And please throw your, we got the Q&A open. So toss in your questions in the Q&A and, uh, and we don't need to wait till the end. Maybe we'll, we'll just, we'll stop in the middle, answer questions as we go and, and go from there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce the panelists. Uh, first I'll introduce myself. So my name is Javi, I'm a, a co-founder here at CM Builder and uh, I'll be the panelist or host today, I guess, the host of the panel today, uh, moderator. Uh, first, we want to introduce uh, is Ross Massey. So Ross Massey in from Florida, out of the heat. Uh, Ross Massey is the lead superintendent at Verdex Construction in Florida, helping deliver desperately needed large-scale multifamily projects in the rapidly growing uh, real estate market in Florida. Ross has held a variety of roles in construction, from estimating to project management. And prior to uh, Verdex, he spent almost nearly six, six years with Acom Tishman, working as a project manager on large and interesting projects. Uh, Ross has a master's in construction management from Central Connecticut State University. Welcome aboard, Ross. Thanks. For Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. So next is Matt Moore. Uh, Matt Moore is a, a superintendent at SB James Construction in Northern California, has been with the company for nearly three years. Prior to his time at SB James, uh, Matt worked with uh, Whiting Turner Company for over six years, both as a super and project manager, providing a training ground for to, har to harness his project delivery skills. Um, Whiting Turner working on large complex projects, as most of you probably know. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Architectural Engineering from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, uh, also a great uh, basketball school, if I remember correctly. Matt, <laughs> welcome aboard, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Uh, last but certainly not least, Jonathan. Jonathan Ruggeberg is graduated from cum laude from, uh, with a Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Texas at Arlington. And shortly after, launched into his career in the construction industry. Jonathan got his uh, first superintendent role at ACOM Hunt. So some ACOM uh, connections on this call. ACOM Hunt, where he spent over six years building complex institutional projects. Uh, Jonathan then joined DPR Construction about four years ago as a construction superintendent. And after a number of years in the field, has recently took on a new role uh, as a central region innovation leader. So he sits between the technology teams and the field teams to help drive uh, innovation and productivity, project delivery, and development of the talented team at DPR. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank how did you. I do, how did I do in the, uh, on the intros there, guys? Not too bad? Yeah, uh, awesome. Way, way to your homework, Kyle. You didn't say anything to me. These guys didn't say anything. They're too, they're too humble. They don't want to be introduced. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's dive right in. Before I go into the first question, I just want to, to do my little spiel of what a construction superintendent is, has it impact has had on me. I have a sports background, so uh, actually, before I do that, I had a joke here. Get your get your popcorn ready. Get you ready. Get your popcorn ready. I got my I got my real pop. Oh no no! I better not eat popcorn on li live on TV here because. Cheers, I'm, cheers. I'm gonna be parched. I'm gonna be parched. Um, so I remember um, you know, as being from the football world, sports world. I think the closest thing I've seen to a leader in in large scale team sports is a construction superintendent. You know, the idea of getting in front of a large group with a common goal, making sure you deliver something safely on time, profitably, uh, be able to communicate to different types of folks. Um, you know, superintendents are pretty amazing. They're, the joke in the in the write up is that you know the, our superheroes of construction maybe don't wear capes and tights. I hope you guys don't wear tights. Not every day, anyways. I wear tights on my bike and I get chirped all the time. I probably shouldn't do that, but um, no one wants to see that. But um, yeah, so I, I remember my first project I was ever involved with was a large scale mass timber project, one of the first institutional mass timber, timber projects in North America. And I walked into the trailer and the superintendent was describing with an architect like this floating stair de detail, like really technical details of how this floating stair is gonna come into place and why it might not work, you know, from a from a constructability perspective. And um, and then, you know, five minutes later, talking to an owner at a different level, right, a high level and being able to communicate clearly about project schedule, project risks, you know, supply chain challenges, all these kind of things. And it just really hit me how incredible uh, the role is and what these people do in the built environment. So that's my, kind of spiel of how I've been impacted by construction superintendents, and I'm just proud to be able to host three amazing ones here today. So let's dive into it. So uh, Jonathan, let's go with you first. So it's 2023. I know uh, things have changed in the world of supply chain, COVID, all these things. You know, what is the 
what is the job of a construction superintendent today? I, I don't think it's changed much, right, in terms of the way that we set up projects. Um, so really, we start out uh, organizing and, and communicating all field related activities. Um, and we ensure processes are being followed uh, by the trade partners, right? So that they're submitting all their required safety documentation, that they're following our, our quality process and, and our delivery coordination process, right? Make sure we don't get any backups uh, when we're getting a bunch of deliveries and, and following you know, how, how we onboard people, make sure we've got all of their documentation you know, in case of any accident that we can reach out to, to them and, and get them to the, the right facilities. Um, and then really we want to generate a framework for, for communication and coordination between trades um, and maintain accountability, right? So uh, we set up a job um, based on coordination with municipalities, facilities, and, and, and the client. And, and like I said, it really hasn't seemed to change much the way that we do it uh, to start it up. Um, it's a lot like I, I, it's akin to, you know, when you see a plumber where there is no bin coordination on the project and, and how he or she knows kind of the dimensions from fitting to fitting to ensure that the right offsets there. And then the plumber also knows kind of the, the rules, not kind of, hopefully he knows them thoroughly, but knows the rules, uh, you know, how much fall. Uh, Etc. Right. So similar, we we've got to go through a similar takeoff process uh, currently, right? And we've got to kind of um, you know uh, you know make our checklist of what we need, how we're going to get there. Um, but what what is kind of interesting, right, is how can we start to have a BIM approach to that setup process, right? And same way that now, you know, the the plumber is it, you know has you know doesn't necessarily have to do those takeoffs by hand. He or she can can leverage the the you know the the bin process and and so that's what I'm excited about right um, uh, so it's, it's, you know obviously a big part of it is just setting setting up the project so where where's our office going to be uh, where are folks going to take lunch um, and those seem like really simple kind of issues but they you know especially working in a hospital no client wants to see trash or or lunch you know in their walls and it's a it's a big deal right so. Um, same thing when we go to do fencing, right? Are we blocking access to an FDC or impeding traffic? Um, and then we've got to order our material, right? Uh, we've got to order bull rock, crane mats, and all those things cost money. Um, and so we got to work with the project team uh, uh, early on to, to make sure that those general conditions, that there's funding for those general conditions. Um, so obviously, that, you know, that's kind of the front end. And then we've got kind of coordinating the movement of materials, deliveries and people, right? So the movement within. So as an example, on, on one of the projects that I worked on, uh, we incorporated uh, a, a prefabricated restroom assembly. And uh, we really had to think about how are we going to move them, not only, you know, once they arrive on site, but how we're going to move them to get them on site, right? From their pre from where we, we, we constructed them. So we had to work with the Department of Transportation in order to get them on site. Um, and then we had to figure out okay, how we're going to move them, right? All really interesting, you know, kind of new scenarios where we had to come up with interesting solutions, uh, innovative solutions. And, you know, least, uh, you know, last but not least, or, you know, is the superintendent really is, it has to think outside the box, right? So uh, an example of this that I'm, I'm, I always think of is um, a superintendent that I'm good friend with, you know, been doing superintendent job for, for, for a long time, you know, 30 years, right? And um, uh, he was building out a linear accelerator for a client of ours. And, um, you know, he, he came into the project and, and said, hey, wait, why are, we, why are we doing a pure and beam foundation here, right? Based on, on my experience, I know that we, in these conditions, that we can, we can do a, a mat slab. Um, poor, right, and and save the save the client money and, and time, and um, it, so so he has to see into the, he or she needs to see into the future, right? So I did Y before, and I had difficulty with X, right? So there's I, I got two kind of quick examples. Um, one of them, you know, like a grade beam brick ledge, right? If you, know, you see the typical detail in the structure drawings where you've got that, you know, at the top of the grade beam. And um, you know, you got to see a little bit in, into the future and say, hey, you know, I see that, you know, this, the, you know, the brick, you know, terminating here at the top of that foundation element is going to possibly 
be an issue when I go to grade the, the site, right? So uh, let's go ahead and let's talk to the design team about moving that to the bottom of that uh, grade beam. Uh, and then the second issue that, that always comes up, you know, that, that we can kind of see into the future as superintendents, right, is uh, kind of coordination between mechanical equipment and the, the electrical drawings, right? We'll see typically uh, a lot of issues where we'll have kind of changes to that equipment uh, during the you know, buyout phase, et cetera. And um, so we always have to remind everybody, hey, don't don't necessarily look only off of the uh, electrical contract drawings. You know, look at what is actually uh, going to be installed. Well, that's great. That's great. And um, so a lot of a lot of good examples there. Like you know, thinking about that example around doing a mat slab as opposed to like the as designed structural slab. Thinking about that's form work. That's more trades. That's more collaboration. Co coordination. Perhaps it's easier to do it this other way and leverage that experience. Ross, I, what about you? I think uh, from your perspective, I, I have a friend here. It's a general superintendent, similar type of role where you're doing. And he told me he spends 75% of his time as a psychologist more than uh, construction details, working with <laughs> his team, coaching, mentoring. You know, I know you talked a bit about the the, the human side of the role. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can share a little bit about what you see the role being in 2023. Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, you got to be the leader out there, you know, with the field staff, with with your own team and with, uh, your trade partners. Um, I mean, they're going to confide in you. They're going to come with you to problems. They need to rely on you to be that guy, be the go-to guy to get these problems resolved. Uh, I'd say more so in Florida than anywhere else in the country. Like, our subs need a lot of hand-holding. So we have a lot of questions that are pretty simple to to follow up on and get resolved. And there's more complex, you know, with, with bigger, more complex jobs like in Miami and the Tampa region that we have, uh, the bigger high-rises. But um, being... Being the leader and using the psychology behind it to, you know, help these guys, our trade partners, making sure they understand that you, know, you guys can come to us with these problems to help get them resolved. Uh, that's one thing I tried with my team. Like, you know, we can be, you know, hard ass superintendents, but they're not going to respond to that. I mean, you need to in certain instances, but for the most part, they need to come to you and feel like if I come to Ross or whoever my other superintendents are, that they can get a response that's going to be fair to them and their team to get that project and situation completed in an effective manner. Um, so I I have some older superintendents who have, take a different approach. It's like, guys, we're, you know, we're going to do things a little differently. I, I understand that approach. I grew up in that approach, but we need we need to help these guys. At the end of the day, we are trade partners. We have to work together to get the job done. The old school approach is it's not it's not going to get it done in this day of age. So, yeah, that's great. And how about Matt? Um, last but not least, you want to chime in on just how you see it in the North NorCal market. You know, what is a construction superintendent in 2023 uh, in your market? Uh, we have to hold a lot of hands in California too, Ross. So it's not <laughs> it's not just Florida. Um, yeah, I mean, John and Ross kind of kind of summed up pretty well. But one new thing that we've been kind of dealing with which everybody has especially on the smaller mid-range jobs that have generally quicker turnovers is lead times right so all of our superintendents you know you have a plan you have a schedule you have a desired way that you want to build the job and then all of a sudden you'll get an update that says hey the switch gear you were ex expect expecting in may yeah it's not coming till september but you still need to meet the end date so then having the audible knowing you know what your options are and kind of adapting with just real life circumstances i mean it is what it is you have to figure out a way to still meet your client's deadline hey school starts on this date the the hospital needs to open whatever it may be but you're not going to have components so that's that's been one of them the other kind of like new trend that we're dealing with um again fallout from kind of covid effects is this right now zoom yeah. this whole you know it has its great side right we here we are in canada and and texas and florida and all over you know and we're sitting having this conversation but now there's this new trend of work from home so obviously you know i would love to figure out how to superintend from home that sounds like a great idea so no us we're still there but maybe not the additional support so like our trade partners their project managers the estimators the some of the suppliers and stuff there's just kind of this common trend where people just aren't working the same way that they are. All of our baby boomer fathers would be so disappointed in us as a as a culture right now. So still maintaining that level of productivity and that output and keeping things on track and on schedule is just there's just new challenges now. You know, it's we're having to adapt constantly. It seems. Yeah, well, I remember my uh, 
my, my, my that same superintendent that I was talking about at the beginning, he told me uh, construction is like a tidal wave. He said once it starts going, you know, it's very hard to stop. And when you you hit on like just turnaround times on on RFIs on questions, picking up the structural engineer, calling them, saying, "Hey, we're looking at this here. We 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 don't think it works. What do you think is an alternative?" The the cycle time to get people to answer has definitely. Uh, uh increased right with with the kind of oh, you send a team's message or a zoom message or you know slack message and they they you used to be able to just go up and tap them on the shoulder and say hey i need this detail yeah. now you're waiting for them to answer you for two three hours and that adds up over time so i can imagine that's a challenge maybe just on the heels of that ross next question um what are the biggest changes to the job you've seen over the last 10 years you already kind of both all everyone kind of hinted on this but maybe you could just focus on okay we know what the job is today how has it changed over the last, say, decade? Uh, to what Matt just said, like the the workforce, a lot of the baby boomers are retiring, skilled labor, and now you know our generation, the millennials, like we we were told to go to college, we were told to go to school, we were not told to pick up screw guns and hammers, and um, so now you know having that workforce that is you know producing a good product and has the skills to give you you know what we were accustomed to 15, 20 years ago it's much more difficult. So, um, you know, definitely, I, it seems like those schools are coming back. I know in Florida is a big push for the trade schools, um, you know, to get get the newer generations back into the trades. Um, right now, it's, this, it's that gap between the baby boomers, you know, leaving the industry, retiring, and then, um, you know, passing on to, you know, the next generation that maybe not have the skill set that we had before. So just, you know, different problems that we're going through with with you know our skilled labor force right now and then the the lack of uh skilled uh force and uh the quantity that you know since post covid has dropped off tremendously i think in construction i forgot the exact number we need millions of people you know in in our industry right now so just getting getting in the amount of people out on the job site is always an issue that's a daily grind we constantly have and then getting the right labor uh that just makes it that much tougher so that's a good one. I mean, this idea of uh, sec, you know, being a plumber wasn't sexy for the uh, ten years, you know, for the last ten years, and um, I think it's slowly changing from what I can mm -hmm. see. I, I definitely see a, a groundswell. But uh, to your point, I mean, you know, you are here today, and you have this. It, these are lagging indicators, right? If you have a whole bunch of people ten years ago not starting getting their tickets, you wake mm -hmm. up two later like, well, we have a, a dearth of, you know, have enough people to do the job. Jonathan, how about you? Have you seen things change over the last ten years since you got out of school? Yeah, I, I think that you know I, I was I was changing my my outlook from from like the old version to the it has like a toggle like hey you want to try the new version and I found myself like this is this is difficult right so I think just number one like we've got a ton of processes that have been developed right that you know hey superintendent does this and here she does it like this right and that's you know I think there's been a lot added to to our plates right and then on top of that the platforms on which we have to do those things are changing a lot um so it, and it, it's a lot of great tools but it's been it's been a great and it, like it, it's been incredible to see kind of the rate of change uh, within those tools um but on the flip side you know talking about you know the labor shortage i mean we we are legitimately seeing and planning out jobs the incorporation of robotic applications right so i mean we are legitimately looking just you know superintendents are starting up a job and asking hey are we gonna have a layout robot here hey are, are we gonna have it or, or do we need to make considerations for how we're gonna place inserts or are we gonna drill it with a robot right um and then even kind of lifting uh rack and pinion you know, scaffolding attached um robots so i think that's a legitimate response to to the problems that i think were, were presented and then also What's been encouraging is is a push for kind of trade coordinated efforts like multi trade rack supports. Um, you know, I know like Hilti has has made a big push for that and have made like really valid claims at how much um, material can be saved through that. And um, it's been exciting to see how we incorporate that into our jobs. And then the multi trade. You know, I was talking about the the restrooms, right? That was a real approach to you know getting the electrician, getting the plumber, getting the um, the the carpenter in a facility offsite and coordinating um, multi on a, on a multi trade level. Uh, sorry, Javier, I think you're on mute. 
I got, I got burned by, uh, sorry about that. Um, so I guess the insight there is to say that, uh, so the change is the mentality. 10 years ago, the superintendent's probably not thinking, hey, I might need a robot to lay out this, you know, whereas now like, okay, there's a, there's a willingness, there's an openness. And of course, DPR is, is pushing this stuff. You're, you're doing an innovation role and, and you know, it'll take time to say the, the overall market to move there. But what you, I think what you're saying there is like, there's, a, there's this recognition, like, wait, there might be a different way and it might not be, you know, we might be on, on technology or robots to do these things. That's really interesting. Uh, Matt, how about you? Things, big, big changes you've seen over the last 10 years? Yeah, really, it's bridging those two things together that Ross said, the generational gap between the the labor pool, right? So you have these baby boomers with this crazy amount of institutional knowledge. They can build anything, right? But they can't send an email. And then vice versa, you have this 22-year-old kid that can manipulate a BIM model and put you or a client into the space very well, but at the same time can't assemble an Ikea desk. So it's like you have these two just completely different at things that we need to blend it's like all right how do we extract all this knowledge into into this person and it's, it hasn't really happened so what is happening in the background around us is all this technology right so you know 10 15 years ago not every superintendent walked around with an ipad that had all the drawings all the rfis all there but now now we do now we have i can't imagine building anything without having an ipad on you know i'm not going to walk back to the trailer to look at the drawings to then walk back to the site that's seems crazy right but that's all been very recently and then the ai thing like i literally have an example of a project where we put our schedule into an AI generator and the computer told us that, hey, you'd be better off if you build the roof first. And it's like, you look at it, and you're like, this thing's broken, this doesn't work. But then we thought about it, like, hey, is it, can we do it? And sh sure as shit, you know, fast forward to the future, it was better. We build the roof on the ground and then we lift the roof up and then we built the walls. And it's like, nobody would have ever thought about that, right? It's like in any other, in any other instance, you're like, how do I build the roof before the walls? But incorporating technology, enables us to further you know improve be efficient change change the game so now it's how do we stay ahead of the curve how do we blend the two things how do we take all the fundamental building knowledge from the baby boomers and then this brand new technology that everyone's figuring out right now doesn't know how it works and then ultimately be efficient and produce produce a, a thing so we're all trying to adapt we're all trying to catch up but it's it's interesting but it's difficult <laughs> you know we're 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 Figuring it out as we go along together, definitely. So yeah, one thing that, sorry, uh, something that, that reminded me of Matt is, you know, I, I I always would think, hey, you know, we're we're moving towards kind of a new way, but I, I I started to come to you know terms with the fact that you know every I think every generation has generated some kind of innovative approach, right? Because you talk about that that idea of building the you know the the roof first and. And then I did some some researching, and I you know I, I came across that the 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 not the lift build, but you know it, it's similar, right? That that you you cast the floor down, and then you jack it up on the columns, and I guess it went away, you know, due to safety concerns. But I I, I think that 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 desire to to change our industry, I think, is 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 part of being a builder, right? So I I I do get your problem, but I think that it's I think we need to have, you know, I, I think folks are 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 really well equipped these day this, this day and age. So just to counter it, not that I disagree. Uh, I think Umbrella is a product for a team that's trying to build. They build basically a grade, and then they freestand the columns, and then they they basically lift up the the we build the top floor first, at grade, jack it up, build at grade, so you don't have to deal with like heights and different things and. As you discussed there, Matt, it hit me up in conversations I've recently about top-down top construction, which I'm not an expert on. I know in you know, Central America and stuff like that has done a lot more. But when someone starts breaking down the fundamentals of top-down construction, even though it's it's hard for you as a human to kind of think through this in your head, I'm sure if an algorithm looked at this or if there's uh, data, they'd be like, oh, actually, it probably makes a lot of sense to do your parking structures top-down in, in a lot of markets, depending on soil conditions and th different things, right? But in, you know, to your point, Matt, like you might not have thought of it that way when you built the schedule, because you just, you've always built it, you know, you excavate, fir excavate first, then you start building the structure. Why would you do it the other way around, right? So that's great. And um, so going forward, so let's pontificate for the future, Jonathan. I know you like to do that. It's part of your job. Um, what are the biggest challenges going forward? You already talked talked a little bit about this, but maybe you can, you know, in our pre-call, we mentioned burnout in the industry, work-life balance being challenges, succession planning. Maybe we can start there, but what are some big challenges for the job going forward? 
I mean, I'd love to get you know Ross and Matt's opinion on this, but you know, I would see superintendents who would be willing to relocate, right, to stay at an extended stay for the job, right, to really kind of sacrifice their their lives for for the job. And I don't, I don't think people are going to be willing to do that as much anymore. And especially, you know, we were talking about kind of the upskilling and the the requirement to you know, that superintendents have that computer literacy nowadays, right? That I, I think, and on top of that, coupled with the fact that a lot less people are uh, interested in kind of taking that superintendent path, I think superintendents are going to see their value and they're going to continue to see their value grow, right? And then, I mean, I, you know, shameless plug here, but, you know, I am very fortunate because I have personally seen kind of the dedication that DPR has for, for that work-life balance, right? And it is, a leadership top down um it, it is something that has to be top down as well as bottom up right it, it, it and it's it, it it needs to be kind of exemplified by by folks at the top and and to really push it almost as a rule right not like you know not not to just say it but to actually enforce it so that there are like, because at the end of the day you know and I, i'm sure that all of y'all have have encountered this the 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 requirement to have mental acuity on a job is imperative right like you can't be burnt out on a job because you're going to make you're going to make judgment calls that you will you wouldn't otherwise make so it's imperative i think to companies to understand that it's not just about you know you know people having a good time on the weekend or or whatever it's it's about setting up the job for success uh, you know giving people that 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 time to 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 you know, rest up and, and be there for the job uh, 100%. That, that general super role too, I talked recently with, uh, I think Mike signed up here, but Mike Bogdash from, from Landmark, who I think lives in, in PA and travels, you know, from job to job, right? He's all over the country building jobs. And, you know, this is extremely challenging. I can't, you know, sometimes I'm like, wow, you know, how do you even do this? And there's another opportunity for technology. But, um, you know, Ross, maybe I'll go to you, or sorry, I, um, Matt, I'll go to you next. Uh, what do you think, what do you think the future looks like? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Jonathan said. We're, we're seeing it. And I myself is an example. I've been in, in the field superintendent for the better part of 10 years. And literally in the last like six months, I'm strongly transitioning to a more pre-con business development role simply because I'm tired of being out of town. Uh, it's a nature of the job almost, right? You know, construction, we travel, but, um, it, he's 100 right it it burns you out it does like living in extended stays packing up sunday night getting home friday or saturday especially you know last part of the job you're working six seven days a week you don't see your family for a long time it wears on you so you know you we, we try to counter it by having distinct market territories right and hiring people that live there and and but at the same time you know you got to expand the business and then now again with technology it's easier for you you get you get opportunities you know further away so you want to grasp at those opportunities but how do you staff them you know we already talked about it don't need to beat a dead horse here but yeah staffing skilled labor is hard enough and then you're asking your skilled labor to to travel to go somewhere they're like no i'm going to be a skilled labor right here because they need me right here so that 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 challenge is definitely something that we all have to navigate and at the same time um, clients still expect their projects to be done at a certain budget and material prices are here and then you're factoring in people that don't want to go and you have to pay people more so it's it's definitely um an interesting area that we as a society are having to figure out because yeah nature of the thing is supply and demand if you don't have people to build the, the project it's not going to be built and it naturally makes things cost more like hell a big mac is like 12 dollars now you know what i mean because you have to pay everybody there 40 dollars an hour because nobody wants to work like it's it's a it's a just a natural thing so i i don't know where it's going i i do know that our society is going to continue to build and we're going to figure it out but yeah, it's burnout is real. Burnout is real. Superintendents holding the bag, aren't, aren't you? Right. And when when someone doesn't show up or someone doesn't do the job, who does it? Yeah, you know, the we do. Gonna, so it, it, it's that's a lot to carry on your shoulders. Ross, you want to talk a bit about what you think is big for the next ten years, or what people need to be aware of? 
Yeah, I mean, same same thing. Jonathan and Matt said. I mean, the burnout. It's it's tough. It's every job has its challenges. Um, I know I I came off a job in Massachusetts. I had six days notice. I was in Miami on one of the worst jobs I've ever been on in my life. So um, <laughs> working seven days a week for almost almost four months straight. I mean, it was it was tough. Um, the burnout. It definitely you know makes you question things a little bit. But uh, when you see the end result, you know that you know it's all for it and make the client happy. But uh, changing that, I don't. I'm, I hope it changes. I know, you know, our company does a great job with, you know, trying to keep the guys on rotation. We internally do rotations with our guys. I don't want them working ever more than six days a week. Um, I, I try to keep the hours, you know, relatively manageable based on our, you know, our trade schedules. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely a, something we definitely need to look at further in the industry because um, to Matt and Jonathan's points, we're as supers, we are the ones that are expected to be there if things are not going well and people are not showing up, we need to be there. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think it's going to take work, right? It's going to take work to find that solution. The same way that it would take work to give yourself the opportunity or give oneself the opportunity to take some time off, right? So it takes front end work um, to reap those those benefits. And and maybe we're, you know, I, I'd love to, you know, kind of group up, you know, further and think, think more about hey how can we address that problem specifically yeah i mean it's it's something that i've, I've seen i've heard people moving to different shifts you know four ten hour days versus five you know I, that doesn't always work because i know you have cycle times with the construction sequence but yeah the thinking out of the box is to plan through that um so on a positive side, not, not that it's positive, this is, this is the reality, right? We're facing reality as construction superintendents. There's challenges um, in the job and, and maybe some more acute ones now. Maybe next question, I'll go back to you, Matt. I know you mentioned, you hinted that you're moving more into the pre-con world, which I've seen a trend definitely over the last couple of years. Maybe someone will tell me they've always been doing this, but I'm seeing more and more in pursuit, in early planning with the client meeting before you even have the job of supers at the table talking about sequencing, site logistics, project risks, supply chain, cost, you know, maybe not cost for every material, but understanding, you know, alternatives to, you know, different means and methods to, to deal with prefabrication or non-prefabrication and understanding the constraints in the market. Can you talk a bit about the craft of the job just when it comes to setting up you know, a project for success in pre-construction, um, you know, what, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked maybe. Uh, do you mind just kind of diving into that? Sure. Yeah, so I, my, my background, I kind of touched on all three. Started, you know, small residential construction family, then went to the big national, you know, Whiting Turner and did every bit of size of jobs from the $2 million target remodel to the, you know, three commas, over a billion dollar, um, there's mega projects. So kind of saw all of it. And then now I'm kind of in a more middle of the road uh, size company, you know, the, the 20 to $100 million dollar projects. And there is definitely a common trend, a common sequence, you know, of setting up the job regardless of the scale. Obviously, the relative durations for each one of these phases changes a little bit, but there's definitely, uh, I'm a little biased, but the companies I've worked for have gone after mostly design build work, right? Not necessarily plans and specs jobs of handing a superintendent a set of plans and say, good luck, let me know if there's problems. By the way, this is your budget, don't go over it. Um, <laughs> now it's the, the, the superintendent's role is always early, early on. We have a napkin sketch, right? And then we have a target budget that we're trying to get to. So let's be innovative right off of the bat. All right, this is what we know. This is a budget it's not going to be real it's not possible but let's see how close we can get to this fictional budget of what they want and how can we think outside the box and how can how can we get there and that just transition of bringing the superintendent early on has been nothing but but success so then to take it a little bit further to refine that because that's ultimately what pre-con is is just a series of refinement I mean, day number one, which now that's my new role is I'm the day number one guy. Hey, this is a project that's coming up. We want to bid on it. So I get told, how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost? Right. It's like, well, all right, I don't want to do the money side. I'll tell you how long it's going to take and I'll tell you a good way to go about it. And then we can see where that lands us and then we can refine it further. Right. So that that process is the same on every scale job. What do you know? How would you like to build it? put together a big ticket schedule, you know, big chunks of time. And then it's 
bring in the trade partners. You know, I don't want to use the buzzwords, lean, last planner, all that. It's just be efficient. And the most efficient thing you can do is not have just the designers and the, you know, principals of companies tell you how long it's going to take. Let's get the actual superintendent, the trade foreman, the guys that are actually doing the work that know exactly what's going on, not the the false hopes of, yeah, we can build it in a week. No, I want to know the exact sequence. I want to bring them in as early as humanly possible, right? And then stretching it even further, like the guys that you haven't won the job yet, but they're your, your go-to guys. Bring them in super early, you know, and pick their brain and just refine it, refine it, refine it. So that has been just the biggest ticket of success. Start with the people who are going to be doing the work, bringing them into that process as early as humanly possible. And then it's just a matter of expanding until you finally have the solid plan that you're going to then give to somebody to say, here's the plan. Now go build it. Good luck. And by the way, this is your budget. (laughs) (laughs) You just passed the buck. You just passed the buck. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, that's great, Ross. I know I'm talking with you that this is something you're passionate about, kind of setting up that the days of like being a super or, or sorry, a general saying, here's a, here's a package of work. Here's three bidders, low bid wins. And by the way, delivered on time and budget or else. Right. And then just beat them up for the next two years. Those days are long gone. As you hinted, you talked a lot about working collaboratively with your sub trades and your partners. Maybe can you talk a bit about how you like to set up jobs? What are some tips and tricks you've learned over the years and kind of doing that pre-con pre-construction phase yeah i mean very very similar to how matt sets it up i mean we it's not a it's not an ipd you know method where we bring in everyone design side as well we we try to have meetings um during the pre-con if we have the pre-con contract bringing the architect in with some of our specific trades uh, mostly meps involved uh but to matt's point bring them in as early as possible some of our partners we do business with on a regular basis um and saying you know how would you do this how would you make this happen? What do you think for schedule, putting it up against the schedule that we internally have already made uh, very roughly um, and going through those very particular details. And like Matt said, refining them day by day by day until we feel comfortable. We have a very legitimate plan to build this job within the parameters that ownership gives us, um, hopefully within budget and uh, usually with, within schedule. Um, but yeah, bringing, bringing them in the earlier, the better. And that was something on our job, our current job that I'm on now, when we had these guys signed up, we wanted them in two weeks after. I didn't care if they were putting in handrails 10 months down the road. Like we want you in to understand how you're going to do it. And, and one, it, it gave us a better understanding if they were actually looking at this job and understanding what they had to do. So, and it gave the impression that you guys are going to work with us. We are going to expect you to look at these drawings and understand this project. This market is so saturated right now that a lot of guys were taking on a lot of work and we didn't want to have this project be another one, just another revenue stream for them. We wanted to make sure that this is a project you guys have looked at the drawings, understand what needs to happen, and we have a game plan from you so we can incorporate that into our schedule. And Ross, you know, adding on to that, I'm sure that we we all live by you know, the, the tried and true kiss method, right? The, the keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> so, you know, thinking through that and then thinking through kind of the, the previous topic regarding kind of work-life balance, you know, something that, that I, I, I am really proud about is, is, you know, we select projects that are close to us, right? That's, right, we're selective and strategic in that way in order to offer kind of, you know, the best of both worlds, right? So, I think that's one example where, hey, you know, it, 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 there there are times for for you know data and and analytics, but sometimes really the easiest solution is is the right one. Well, so Jonathan and Ross talked uh, IPD ish approach, meaning just early early engagement with trades, uh, accountability to understand scopes of work and make sure you're clear clear with what's expected, uh, and. I think DPR, I don't know if it's exactly, but either, I, I think you guys wrote the book on IPD or, or literally. Or literally. Close. So, uh, you may have literally done IPD. <laughs> Maybe can you talk a bit about uh, on your side from a pre, from a project setup? I know your roles changed a little bit and you're, you, you're looking at technology to help this stuff, but uh, maybe can you talk a bit about either IPD or just ways you've seen it really work well uh, at DPR with, with regards to setting up jobs in, in pre-con or pursuit? 
Yeah, you know, unfortunately, the market here in in Texas doesn't really lend itself currently to to IPD. Um, it's tough to kind of get buy in from from clients. Obviously, I, I I would love to see more projects kind of um, uh, kind of pursued that way. Um, but you know, really, we have um, uh, strategic forms of uh, of kind of analyzing uh, where you know where did we succeed in the past, right? And leveraging all that data. In order to 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 you know see what what worked right so um, yeah unfortunately I can't talk too much on that one <laughs> yeah <I guess laughs> the special sauce there that's all right is it, we we like to share but we don't have to share everything you know it's all good um, so I, I'll go right back to you. next so a question came in by the way for everyone who's uh who's listening if you have questions go on the Q and A drop them in there. And we'll plug away. We got one that just came in from Nikon. Thank you. It actually is the same question that I was just about to ask. So it's perfect timing. Um, so you're all on this panel because not only are you good at building stuff, but you're also open to technology, right? Obviously, that's where we come in um, and, and adopting new technologies, trying new things to help make project delivery better. Jonathan, so can you talk a bit about how platforms like CM Builder or others are helping you deliver projects better and, and, and more efficiently and with better collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I want to touch back on the point regarding the kind of new mode of of communication, which is the virtual meeting, right? So I think that is is something that we're still understanding how how that's going to play out. Um, but at at the heart of it, you know, my real passion is is just communicating complex issues um, to clients and the facilities and the user groups. Uh, and our design partners to 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 uh, to enable efficient decision making, right? So one thing that um, I encountered several times was the um, kind of uh, coordinating uh, facility shutdowns, right? For 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 a hospital, you can imagine what a big deal that is, right? When when you're actually affecting um, patient care, um, so being able to to coordinate that and to effectively demonstrate it and show it to the to the to the, to the client is is imperative. Um, so what I am what I am really interested in is the ability to combine all of the separate um, sources of of data that that there are available to us, right? Before you do a, a a vellum overlay, right? And and that would be you know the 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 bee's knees. But now we've got access to like an insane amount of 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 data that that we can that we can compile right take a look at and, and analyze um, in coordination with our with our partners right with the stakeholders um, on the project in order to 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 facilitate that decision making which at the end of the day that that's a big reason why schedules you know why we lose time on the schedule is just getting somebody to make a, a decision um, so uh, another uh, kind of technology and and form of of kind of communicating uh, virtually that I'm I'm pretty excited about is 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 uh, by a company called SiteLink that is is kind of deploying a um, kind of a, a virtual you know sometimes when I, I as as we started into the the virtual meeting um, kind of space I remember kind of feeling like a like a reporter you know on the scene reporter with my iPad and sometimes it would get too close to my face and they'd see my pores and everything but you know I'd say hey look this is the issue that we're dealing with. Right. Look, look up here. This is the piece of equipment, or this is the existing piping um, um, main that's that's prohibiting us from being able to accomplish uh, this this job that that we've got. Right. And now, um, now it, it's 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 now kind of a a made forum for us to kind of show in in contextual space kind of what we're talking about. Right. And what's 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 being um what you know what what our issue is so that is that that's pretty exciting is is kind of how we're going to now navigate this new virtual meeting space um, so also um um so the iot sensors i you know i know that the concrete sensor has been out for a long time right but you know i, I was on a project just recently um that, that they are like at a break breakneck speed Right, they were they they have to start placing concrete, um, you know, during normal business hours because of, of the residential residential area that they are in. So they're done finishing concrete at like 4 p.m. in the afternoon on some days, right? Which you can imagine is 
is incredibly strenuous and everything, but it's actually after all the work that they've completed to generate these maturity curves and coordinate with the design team and coordinate with the testing laboratory. I mean, these guys are stressing tendons at you know 8 a.m. the next morning, right? So the ability to to not have to wait for an email um, and and you know formal correspondence from the testing lab in order to accomplish that, I, I think is is incredible, right? All that information goes straight through a gateway into into the cloud, and they can use that information to make a decision. Um, so uh, what I'm also really excited, you know, going back to kind of what it takes to set up a project is kind of starting to document what it what it takes, right? And and starting to be able to share that information with people who maybe haven't started it, right? And and kind of use it as a visual checklist of hey, this is what I should, this is what I should plan for, this is what worked, and you know, pick up the phone, call the team that that did that project and say, hey, was did you have enough hoists on that project? Did were people standing around? Right, and that's another technology that's pretty exciting. Right, is is these uh, is is a, a hoist calling platform uh, that we're using on another project is, and we're able to see in real time that data of hey, how long are people waiting there? Do we need to make any kind of quick quick adjustments to to the lunch period? Do we have to have a conversation with the client and say hey, you know what, maybe we should eat lunch on the floor, right? But at least it's not a surprise when they show up, right? Uh, but we can explain to them hey. Based on the data, um, this is really affecting our productivity. I love it. I um, one thing, just like as you're talking there, I remember, uh, and this I think there's technical reasons for this. So I'm not gonna. If there's any uh, engine, say structural engineers, don't yell at me. But I, I was always blown away that you know you'd have like the say, say vertical construction towers. A lot of projects we work involved with. It's like you have these transfer slabs, and before you pour, the structural engineer has to like physically be there and sign off on everything's meeting their their expectations and a lot of times that becomes a bottleneck right whether they can physically get there or not and with what you're seeing with drones and photogrammetry and different types of like as built reality capture this is probably already happening in many places so if you're already doing this but a lot of the projects i've been involved with and in recent they don't do this still right they don't use that and there are going to be risks of course that people are not comfortable signing off on something just from a camera or you mentioned that site link idea is like, well, if you can basically be there without being there, how much more productive can we be on sign offs, right? Which means we're gonna have better cycle times, which means where productivity is gonna go up. Ross, I was gonna I, uh, ask you, I know that you're pretty detailed in your project setup when it comes to kind of simulating how you're gonna be accessing the project, how cranes are gonna be swinging, all that kind of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you've seen in technology and how projects like Seam Builder and others have helped you set up the jobs? Yeah, the, the two big technologies on our job that we've incorporated and now we're in the process of incorporating it uh, company-wide with Vertex. Um, Seam Builder one, I mean, I, I really spearheaded that one with logistics and looking at the front end of jobs for providing uh, logistics to ownership for pre-bid purposes. And then um, open space has been another uh, technology that we're most likely going to be incorporating over the next three months uh, for all of our projects on ours is kind of the pilot program. And it has been amazing uh, documentation. We have three superintendents that myself included that walk that job every day, top down to understand one, documenting the project, two, finding problems, coming back to the laptop, taking, you know, field notes constantly. It's like, man, this this doesn't look right. Let's take a field note. Let's go back. Let's look at it. Let's discuss it with, you know, our team and understand, you know, if it relates back to any RFI, anything with the architects, sending out quick emails, this that collaborative approach that we need from the field to the office. It kind of ties everything together with uh with the open space technology and then with CM Builder, uh, as I've told you, Javier, I use that with our trade partners constantly, um, just so they're very visual learners. They they understand the the project um, when they're out there, but then you put it on the screen, they kind of have to orientate themselves. With the CM Builder, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, so we can go over exactly what logistics need to be done, how I expect the how I expect it to be done, and there's very little uh, left to the imagination on our plan going forward. So those. CM Builder and Open Space have been great on, on our projects uh, thus far. This has been great. So, so far in our superintendent talk, we've talked about robots, we've talked about automated layout, we've talked about 360 cameras, we've talked about metaverse type applications. This is pretty, the, this is a great insight of how the, the job has changed. 
Uh, Matt, so I know I, I've been over the shoulder of Pedro and you have been once working through some of your projects and seen unbelievably detailed stuff and cool stuff you've done in the pre-con phase. And I guess when you're super in pre-con and going to a client, you're basically a storyteller. Um, how have you leveraged technologies like CMBuild and others to, to basically set up jobs better, communicate better? What insights can you share with that regard? Totally. Um, yeah, just Real quick though, open space. I'm spot on with with Ross. The the yeah. 360 camera on top of the hard hat. You look like one of those Google, you know, Priuses driving around street image, but it is amazing. So during construction, yeah, that's been a that's been a saving grace technology for sure. But yeah, for 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 precon, um, me, you know, my background's heavily in, in scheduling. I was the pool planner guy, right? And so once you got into the billion dollar the billion dollar projects, there's not enough wall space in the world for you to do sticky notes on there. So the 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 companies started with touch plan and now I'm the planner, you know, a little plug there for, for those guys. Um, that has been an invaluable platform for actually figuring out the, the sequence with your trade partners, right? You know, the zoom meeting, let's have a pool plan session virtually. It's all electronic and be as big as you want. And then now adding in CM builder to where here's the site logistics, here's the 3d look. So you have both of those simultaneously. So you're developing the schedule, you're developing the site logistics. Everybody is able to see it better. And then now you can take that to the client because most of the time clients can't look at a P6 schedule and, and see anything. They look at the summary up top that says, when's it done, right? That, that That's not giving you anything. And then similarly, it's like you look at a Google Earth image that somebody took crayon and put some arrows on and said, I'm going to enter here. I'm going to enter, you know, exit there. It doesn't sell the story. It doesn't paint the picture for non-construction type folk that can't see that from a 200 page set of drawings. So factoring all those things in of here, here is a visual tool that shows you what our schedule is, that you can look at crew flow. You can have that conversation with uh, a, a single trade partner, and then you can explain it to the client too, of like, this is why your project is more expensive because you're saying I have to stop here and send everybody home and then bring them all back. It's like it's nine different projects and you can you can you can sell those things a lot better. And then the 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 actual 3D component of here, let me spin the project around and let's look at it from this angle so you can see why we're doing that. So just all that together. Yeah, we can we can I can literally show my grandma exactly what I'm doing and she finally <laughs> understands it. Like it's it's perfect. <laughs> Happy grandma, happy life. You gotta keep yeah, grandma happy. happy. That's awesome. Um, oh, that's all fantastic. So a question came in from Rachel. Uh, so you mentioned a lot about hand holding at the top of the session. Can you say more? I'll put this up to all of you and anyone wants to jump on this. Um, could you say more about the hand holding? Like what would you attribute that to? Is it the newer age, like younger labor force, or are there other factors that perpetuate this? I got one that actually happened today. Um, so this morning we have a job. It's doing a, a TI, just remodel of some office space. And the, the building was from like the 1970s. So they use gypcrete, just that real light, flaky, you know, no no rebar. It's basically you're putting flour on the, the deck and saying that's a floor. So the flooring guy came in today and uh, just threw his hands up and said, it, it's, it's flaking. Um, so tell us what you want us to do. And so it's like, okay, all right, so you're not going to give us any insight as to like options. It's just, oh, I can't work. So call me back when you're ready. And so it's like, okay, literally how to make some phone calls, get some product recommendations, which there's a lot, by the way. It's not a, a, an unnatural thing, but that's kind of just like a, a simple, it happened today, a simple example of not necessarily taking that extra step to to solve it figure it out you know you're just going to come there with one task and if anything is a roadblock then you're just going to throw your hands up and 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 leave and then we got to have that dr phil moment of like you know why well, how can we solve this together like i didn't mean to yell at you and hurt your feelings i was apology you know like let's just get to the finish line together um i don't know it seems like it's happened more and more recently of you know, that not my job kind of mentality versus, you know, when you have the big IPD type jobs where it's, you know, you you kill that right away. It's it's all of our jobs. We're all we're all sharing the same potential, the same victory. We're all a piece of the a piece of the pie. But you don't necessarily have that on a lot of jobs. People don't know what the big picture is. They don't know anything about the jobs. You'll have foremen that'll show up and they'll be like, all right, 
what are we doing? And it's like, what do you mean? What are we, what are you doing? You didn't get any kind of like heads up or indication from your office about this project we've been talking about for six months. So, uh, you know, it all ties together, right? Labor shortage, people traveling, and it's like information, even though we have the ability, the technology to transfer that information so quickly and easily, it doesn't necessarily always happen. So that's, Rachel, hopefully that's kind of an example of the hand-holding, figurative hand-holding that we're, that we're talking about. Another question that came in, um, I have a feeling Jonathan might be passionate about this one, from Patrick. Uh, what are you doing to incorporate lessons learned across your companies? Ooh, that's a big one. Um, I, I think we're, not I think, what we are doing is that we're, we're strategically honing in on um, our, our five core strategies, right? So VDC, design to build, um, prefabrication, and, um, and we're making sure that we are, that, that we're developing a framework that encompasses those, those strategic priorities, right? So I think it's about kind of limiting it all down to, well, what's important to us? Right. And and let's let's build out let's build out the knowledge base within there. So, I mean, specifically, which platforms do we use? I mean, it's more, um, you know, Microsoft um, SharePoint. Right. We've got a, a website and anybody can go into the toolbox. You know, a common saying is, you know, when somebody asks a question is you say, well, it's in the toolbox. Right. So enabling that quick access to to information. Um, and generating, I mean, we've got so many smart people at DPR that just generate such incredible content that um, that that's something that I, I, that we are blessed with is is having that content and, and readily accessible on our SharePoint site and and specifically honing in on on those things that that we that that we strategically are, are focused on. Wait, Ross, Matt, are you guys do anything on the lessons learned or knowledge sharing side of things? Yeah, I mean, my, our, mine's a little easier. We're a relatively small company. So, you know, we get together on weekly calls for, you know, the relatively, you know, associated groups and then a monthly call, all hands where everybody gets on. We kind of just status of the company, how, you know, let's highlight some projects. And there's always a lessons learned component to that. And so we 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 track those in a in a log. And then some of them, it's, you know, it'll spin off an additional training based on it. Like this is something that we we dealt with. This is a new condition in the market. This is a new team, but there's a new software that we're now, you know, now incorporating. So let's set up some additional things. So for me, it's a little easier for the, you know, the DPRs and the Whiting Turners. You don't necessarily have those that get the whole company involved on a regular basis type things. So I, I do think that that's kind of, we were talking about kind of, it, I couldn't find anything bad to say about virtual kind of meetings, right? I, I, everything I said was good, but I think that's where it breaks down, right? Is that knowledge share. It, it really, it really does need to be, and I spent a lot of my time driving, you know, within, you know, Texas to kind of make it out to teams, right, and see what they're doing. So I think that human component, I think that is probably one of the aspects where, where hopefully we can, we, we can find a way to adjust within the new mode of, of communicating to, to kind of, you know, sh pass down that knowledge, you know, on a Friday when the job's winding down, you know, you're just waiting for the last guy to wrap up and you're, you know, shooting the shit with, with each other, you know? Um, I, I will, uh, and we just have a couple of minutes left here, but to wrap, I'll, I'll actually chime in on this. I think with, with a lot of the data creation and capture tools that are happening now, so like this meeting, right, you can translate it or like convert it into a, a text file with AI, uh, you could save that in a SharePoint file, or we built a toolbox as well where, where people can search different things. I think the biggest challenge going forward is how do you make it easily accessible? How do you understand the, how do you enable the business process for people to know I should go look for that thing when I don't have it, when I need to find it, right? Like it's like capturing the data is going to get easier. Putting it somewhere is going to be easier. Indexing is going to be easier. It's the process of how do you make sure that you don't walk past someone's screen and realize, why are you doing that manually? We like built the whole thing just to automate that process. Oh, I didn't know where it was. Oh, why didn't you look in the toolbox? Well, you know, so there's some change matters of process that has to go into it, right? Jonathan, as you say, and some of it is just good old fashioned elbow grease, just being next to each other and like, 
bumping each other a bit. Like, come on, man, let's, it's right there. Just do, you go find it. So it's, you know, the, but that what is encouraging from a technology perspective is that there's so much going into this, right? The capture, you know, being able to use technology like Otter and different types of things to convert, you know, meetings into minutes, minutes into databases, databases into learning and large language models for just companies will become a thing where they'll search the entire, every DPR meeting, you know, could be looked into for the 10 year period and you can grab insights and understand, okay, how did we handle that problem when we had that issue where it could have been a mat slab instead of the as designed structural system. And, you know, we, you know, how does the next time that happen, the person who was slightly less experienced than that superintendent you referenced can also get the same outcome, right? That's better business outcome for the company. Um, listen, I was I had a few more questions here about uh, what's your favorite part of the, why don't we do this rapid fire? We got, we're at, we're at an hour. What's your favorite part of the job? Ross, go. Relationships, building, building the teams, uh, getting to know those teams and uh, just seeing how they perform and the, the camaraderie. It's like, you know, I'm a sports guy as well. I grew up playing football, wrestling, like just, just being, being with the teams. I, I, I love that aspect of, of building and then seeing that, that final product and hopefully making the ownership happy and they, they want to continue the relationship. It's awesome. Matt, what's your favorite part of the job? Uh, other than the uh, celebration beers at uh, turnover, um, <laughs> I, I actually the reason why I switch. I really like this initial like how can we build it? Like it's just a puzzle right off the bat. So yeah. it's just figuring out what's the best way to solve the puzzle. I really enjoy that. Awesome, Jonathan. What's your favorite part of the job? Yeah, similarly, I, I think to me it's just about how how things come together, right? Like how do you fit things together? You know. How do you put a block inside of a, a hole, right? Just the tactile of it, nature of it. I guess that, you know, that architecture background always coming through, right? I always want to be a builder <laughs> at heart. Uh, listen, I just want to say on behalf of the our team here and everyone that chimed in, thanks, guys. That was amazing. Uh, I could go for another two hours if we uh, if we if time time wasn't so valuable. But uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for everyone who who joined. Uh, our goal here was to share, you know, community and stuff like that. And I thought you guys did an awesome job. So thanks for this, and uh, you know, till the next time. <laughs>